everybody. Um, I am a postdoc in the Allosphere Research Group at UC Santa Barbara. Um, I'm going to be talking today about live coding and live coding performances using a browser-based environment I created called Jibber. Uh, but first, a little more about the, the lovely campus of UCSB. If you ever have a chance to come to Santa Barbara, uh, it's a great place to visit and hang out. Maybe not the best place to get a degree, because you're less than half a mile away from the beach at all time but uh, a very nice place. And I work in a virtual reality facility, a scientific instrument down there called the Allosphere. And this is the Allosphere from the top looking down into it. It's a three-story sphere um, enclosed inside of a cube with a bridge mounted in the horizontal and vertical center of the sphere. And we have 26 projectors inside of the sphere that cover the entire surface of the sphere with scientific simulations and data visualizations. And that's actually the director of the Allosphere, um, Joanne Cotero Moran, standing on the bridge um, right there. The surface of the sphere is actually perforated with tons of tiny, tiny holes. And when you have light shining on the outside of the sphere, it basically makes it look like it's transparent. But when those lights are turned off and you're on the inside of the sphere, it really looks like uh, an, opaque, an opaque surface. Um, so this is actually a fractal synthesizer made uh, by the man in the foreground right there, Kenny Kim. And it's, it's a 3D fractal synthesizer. You notice that people are wearing glasses in the sphere right there. And this content is not static content. He's parameterized it so that it's animated and evolving over time. Uh, so here's another shot with basically taking the, the outside of the moon and then kind of mapped it to be um, on the inside of the sphere. And this is looking from one end of the bridge down towards the, the other end. You can accommodate about 30 people on the bridge of the allosphere at a time, which makes it ideal for doing uh, collaborative knowledge discovery inside of there. So instead of just having you know, VR environments where it's just one person inside of it, this has really been set up so you have this giant screen that lots of people can take advantage of simultaneously for doing types of research. But today, I'm going to come back to the Allosphere at the very end of my talk. But today, mostly what I'm going to be talking about is uh, live coding, live coding performance, creative coding, again, using an environment um, that I actually created called Jibber that runs in the browser and is made completely uh, with JavaScript. Uh, but first, a little bit about live coding uh, performance. It means Live coding means something a little bit different in the digital arts community. So it's not just getting up and doing a demo of coding something for a conference or whatnot. It, it's actually getting up on stage, plugging your laptop into a projector and speakers, and coding a work of audiovisual art while projecting your code for the audience members to follow along with. So it's kind of an experimental performance practice. Um, it's particularly popular. Um, in Europe especially, but uh, also in parts of Latin America as well. So the interesting thing about this is that um, we're introducing transparency into the performance process. So it's not just me or somebody else standing up here as a DJ kind of dancing around and moving things every once in a while, but you and the audience don't really have any idea what we're doing. I could just be checking my Twitter account and playing a CD. By actually projecting the code as I'm typing it, you're actually able to see me create the algorithms, modify those algorithms over time, and maybe get some type of insight into what the processes are that are actually happening in the performance. And this is some of the, the live coding manifesto taken from a website, toplap.org. If you get interested or inspired by any of this, this is the place to go to get information about all things live coding. And there's a couple of interesting quotes in this, but one of the ones I find most interesting is this one right here. And that says, it is not necessary for a lay audience to understand the code to appreciate it, much as it is not necessary to know how to play guitar in order to appreciate watching a guitar performance. So even if I'm coding to a room of people that are not JavaScript experts, uh, not the situation today, which is really exciting for me, actually, um, there, there's still, hopefully, some type of insight that the audience can get just by watching the code appear, seeing when I execute the code, and, and, and seeing how that manipulates the audiovisual content on the screen. 
So there's a bunch of different types of live coding environments and languages out there. And this is by no means a, a comprehensive list. There are, there are dozens of them. Um, and I just put a, a couple of representative examples up here. And one thing I wanted to point out with these examples is that a lot of them use domain-specific examples. So we can see a bunch of them here where the developers have actually gone and created their own language for doing these types of performances. And that's a really nice thing for the developers to be able to do because it gives them the opportunity for them to encode creative affordances directly into the syntax of the language. So you can make an operator that maybe chains two types of audio effects together. Or you could make another operator that takes two three-dimensional objects in a scene graph and makes their rotations track one another. And having domain-specific language opens up all those different types of opportunities. But at the same time, well, actually, getting ahead of myself a little bit, let's take a look at what a couple of those languages look like. So this is a, um, a system called Ixilang, and it's used to live code music performances. And in it, we can basically see um, this piano module that's, that's being live coded, and I'm creating a piano instance right here, and then I'm sequencing notes of a scale to be played at different moments in time. Basically, the, the, uh, the moment in time that these notes get played is based on where they fall inside of these staple brackets right here. And down here, I see a stringed instrument that I'm sequencing and, and some drums. Different sounds can all be compiled um, inside of Ixilang. And one of the first live coding performances I ever saw was actually an Ixilang performance. It's a really, really fun environment. Um, here's another one, um, Live Code Lab that is also a browser-based environment like Jibber. So if you have a chance to Google Live Code Lab, it'll pop right up. And it's a domain-specific language that's used to control 3JS. So you can basically create three-dimensional objects, rotate those objects, apply different types of effects. And you see the syntax um, is, is fairly simple to, to use. And it, it's um, been used to teach kids and it also in use in live coding performances as well. But as I started getting more and more interested in live coding, I was interested in the potential of JavaScript for a live coding environment. Because JavaScript, although it's, it's, it's a fairly flexible, expressive, and, and dynamic language, it's also general purpose. I mean, we've, we've heard people um, at this conference that have used it for all sorts of different purposes, whether it's client-side, server-side, use in Adobe products, scripting the Unity game engine. There's all sorts of applications that expose a JavaScript API for developers to use. So by working on a live coding platform that uses a general purpose language, uh, we can ensure that the knowledge gained while learning to program in these environments transfers to all of these other systems. So Jibber, uh, my environment, is a browser-based creative coding environment. It provides audio, visual, and interactive affordances. And one of the, the research areas for me is trying to figure out unified ways to approach both audio and visual programming. Um, it uses JavaScript as the end user language, and there's also a server where users can upload the sketches that they make. Um, they're stored in a, a CouchDB database. It's a, it's a node backend. Um, and there's also a WebSocket-based chat room. And you can click on a user's name inside the chat room and instantly start a collaborative code editing session um, using the share.js library. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, so this is Jibber. It's just running at jibber.mat. Uh, that's the Media Arts and Technology program at ucsantabarbara.edu. And um, we see a coding area over on the, the right-hand side here. And on the left is a browser uh, where you can see a variety of different demos that, that show different examples of things, a bunch of different tutorials that explain um, the basic programming concepts in Jibber. I mentioned that there's a database backend where users can publish their files, so you can search that database for maybe you want to see how to do drum programming, or maybe you want to see how to do 3D graphics programming. Uh, and then files that you as a user have individually published and recent files that have been published using the system. But let's take a look at the actual coding that's done inside of Jibber. Um, so I'm going to start out. Uh, the hello world for audio programming in Jibber is just to make a drum beat. I appear to not have internet connection. Oh, I have very slow internet connection. 
Okay, so there's the, the drum beat that's going, and this is basically a simple pattern here where X's are the kick drums, O's are snare drums. And because there's four characters in this pattern, Jibber automatically makes each one of those be a quarter note in duration. If I go ahead and add some symbols here, I can rerun that line of code and just change the drum beat. And now since there's eight characters, it makes each one of those values into an eighth note instead of a quarter note. And so I can just keep kind of going and playing around with different values, see what happens here. Um, if I want to assign a specific value for the tempo, I can do that right here. So now they're all 16th notes. Now they're 64th notes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a drum beat in Jibber. And one of the things that's kind of interested that you might have noticed is that I, as I go and I've been running this line of code over and over and over again, um, there's only one drum beat that's playing at any moment in time. So one of the things that I found that's kind of interesting in Jibber is that it's actually nice to be able to just iterate calls to the constructors to create these objects so that now I don't have to go back in and then change the values of the notes to be something else and then change the values of the durations to be something else. Instead of doing that, I can just manipulate this same section of code and just run it over and over again, and it'll just replace the drum beat that was already there. So I'm doing that by using getters and setters on all the single letter variable names in the global namespace. So when I do my performance at the end, you'll see that I use a lot of single letter variable names, and that's the reason for it. Whenever I store something in a single letter variable, um, the next time I try to assign something to it, Jibber goes in and it checks and sees if there's already an audiovisual object in that variable. And if there is, it goes and it removes it from the audiovisual graph and replaces it with the new object um, that I've created. And this works for both the audio elements and also for the graphical elements as well, as I'll, I'll demo in a second. So let's go in now and make a, a, a synthesizer and just get some examples of how to play notes. So here I'm saying play the note C in the fourth octave, and there's the note C in the fifth octave. Now I can pass those values as a string, but I can also pass numbers right here. And if I pass the number zero, what that does is there's, a, there's basically a default scale inside of Jibber. And zero says select the first note of that default scale. And the, the default scale happens to be C minor in the fourth octave. So if I change this, you hear it just kind of works its way up the scale. So I mentioned one of the uh, nice abstractions for Jibber that it's inside of here is this ability to kind of keep iterating calls to constructors. Another one is the ability to schedule changes to properties and schedule calls to methods over time very easily. So note is a method of my synth object. To sequence multiple calls to this, all I do is I add a dot seek, and then I give it an array of values that I want to sequence. And then just like the drum beat, I give it a duration for how long I want each note to last. And then I can change this to alternate here between eighth notes and quarter notes. Mm. Oh, I cleared it. OK. I, yeah. And I can start the drums back up with it. And then I can also go in and I can tell it to randomly select from these arrays every time it triggers a note. So here, just by adding this dot RND to the end of the array, uh, now it's going to randomly pick both the value and the duration that's used right there. And I can do that also with properties. So the drums have a property called pitch.
So now it's randomly changing the pitch uh, on every drum beat. That since sounds getting really annoying, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> sorry, I let that go on a little too long. Um, but I'll stop that there. And uh, I guess the last thing I'll point out with the audio before I move on to the graphics is that it's also really easy to add um, effects. Um, yeah, so you can add effects to the drums, you can add effects to the synths. There's a bunch of different types of synths available inside of Jibber, and there's a lot of predefined sounds that make it easy to start kind of just combining sounds really quickly. So let's look at the graphics. So with graphics, um, there's two different modes of graphics in Jibber. One is, is wrapping 3JS, and the other mode is wrapping Canvas. And I guess there's actually a third that kind of combines the two together, which I'll explain in a second. But here I can see I can just make a cube. Um, I can tell that cube to spin. Um, and I, again, just like with the drums, I can just keep changing the values and re-executing it. And because I'm using that single letter variable name, I only have one cube that actually appears on the screen at any moment in time. Oops. And the sequencing also works the same way. So I can take the scale and I can sequence changes to it, just like I sequenced changes to the audio earlier. So here I'll sequence changes every 250 milliseconds um, to the scale of the cube that's right there. And we had audio effects that we looked at earlier, um, but there's also different types of visual effects. Let's change it to a different geometry. Um, and let's do a, a kaleidoscope shader. Um, and we can change parameters of the kaleidoscope for how it's doing. And again, we can sequence this. So any property of any audiovisual object, you can just immediately start sequencing things, um, either lining it up with the musical rhythm or just giving it arbitrary millisecond values um, to make changes over time. So one of the, lo the last abstraction that I'm going to kind of talk about before I show a couple of, of, of demos and then go over to some of more of the technology behind all of this is an abstraction that allows you to, to easily do mappings. And it's actually kind of a way of doing uh, a sort of reactive programming, I, I would say. So if I make a drum, uh, drum set right here, and now I make a cube, um, I can go in and I can say, OK, I want the scale of my cube to track the output envelope of my drums. And it immediately starts doing that. And I can do that with any property of any audiovisual property. It also works the other way. I could have the pitch of the drum track the rotation of my cube as it goes around. Or I can do things like, um, let's see. Make this a little easier to hear. I can set the pitch to track the mouse. And again, with the cube, I could have that track the mouse on the x-axis. And basically, the, the, the trick here is to capitalize the, the name of the property that you want to make the mapping between on the right-hand side of the assignment operator. And that's the cue to, to Jibber that you want to set up this kind of reactive programming link between the two properties and do a continuous mapping between the two values as opposed to just taking the instantaneous value at the moment in time when you execute the code. So let's look at some of the different demos that are inside of here. Um, first, I'll start off. This is a, a demo. Um, so that's, that's the whole code for this. Um, so we've got a, some music that's being sequenced right there. And then I'm creating a 2D canvas object, overriding the draw method to create these color bars that are displaying um, the FFT analysis uh, that's being performed inside of there. So here's an example, um, and I can make this a little easier to see full screen. Um, this is a, an example using a, a flocking algorithm um, where each one of the, the tetrahedrons is an agent that's kind of attracted to um, the icosahedron. You see that they're kind of following around. And the audio 
um, each one of the agents is downloading a sound from the freesound.org database. If you haven't checked out freesound.org, it's a great place to find audio files. And basically, I'm querying for audio files that are tagged with the word laughter. And I'm asking to randomly pick one of those files. And then as the agents move up and down, the speed of the sample playback changes, which in effect changes the pitch of the samples. So we could go in here, and I could change this following the, the cat theme that seems to be present in every conference. So it's downloading the samples right now. We Evil cats. OK. Um, so here's a quick example that shows getting the, the webcam. And I think the, the cool thing about this is just that it, it, you know, it doesn't take very many lines of code to do this, right? I have a cube. I tell it, is there still a cat screaming? <laughs> yeah, there is. OK. Well, whatever. I'll, I'll fix that in a second. So there is a video on the cube. Um, I'm spinning it. I have applied a couple of different post-processing shaders to this. Uh, so a halftone shader that's generating that kind of dots effect, and the film shader that's, that's doing this kind of uh, basically doing the color gradient right there. OK, now I'm going to really stop the cats. Um, here's an example of a mouse trail. Because every browser-based creative coding tool has to have a mouse trail in it. Um, and one of the cool things I mentioned earlier is that you can combine 2D drawing in Jibber with um, 3D, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. But let me just uh, show it right here. So I've got a 2D canvas that I've placed onto the screen that I'm drawing to, and it's tracking my mouse position. But now if I go and I say B equals kaleidoscope, I get this crazy effect. So I've actually taken a, a WebGL shader, and I've applied it to the 2D canvas. So what happens is when you first start drawing in 2D in Jibber, you create a canvas object. Jibber goes in, and it places a, a regular canvas object onto the page and creates a 2D drawing context in there. If at any point after that, you create a shader object, like this kaleidoscope shader, Jibber then goes and hides the original 2D canvas, creates a 3D canvas and places it on the stage, and then uses the, the drawings on the 2D canvas that are now hidden to texture a full screen OpenGL quad. And that enables you to be able to do this type of shader processing on type of the 2D drawing. So that's really nice, especially for beginning programmers, because maybe all they can do at the very beginning is draw some squares kind of bouncing around. But if you suddenly pop a bunch of different shaders and start playing around with those, you can get a lot of visual complexity uh, without having to do a lot of coding. OK, I think that's it for those demos. So let's go back to the slides. OK, so mm, there we go. So how does, how does this all kind of work? Um, this is kind of the different libraries that make up Jibber. Um, all the libraries are available both on GitHub and on NPM. So the main Jibber environment up at the top here wraps a library called jibber.lib that you can actually include inside of any normal HTML page. You can basically just put it in a script tag, and then you can write normal uh, Jibber code inside of your page. And there's also an option to not globalize everything. I'm sure you've noticed that everything's in the global namespace in Jibber. So if you want to have everything properly namespaced, that's an option you can pass to the initialization method. And then there's three primary libraries that, that get wrapped in Jibber. One's an audio library, one's a graphics library, and one's an interface library for creating GUIs to control the different audiovisual objects inside of Jibber. Um, since the graphics library basically wraps 3.js in the canvas, and I'm sure most people in here have experience with those, I'm not going to talk about uh, that a lot, um, except to say it, you know, it, it, it makes things a little bit easier. Instead of having to set up a camera and having to define lights and having to deal with all those different aspects, you can just say A equals cube and something pops up. And then as you get more advanced with your programming, you can learn about the, how the camera works and manipulate those properties then. But this lets you get something up on the screen to play with as quickly as possible. But what I did want to talk about today was the audio library, and in particular, um, this gibberish.js, because I think that's an interesting thing 
for, uh, might be an interesting thing for JavaScript developers uh, to, to look at. So um, this is the website for Jibber. It's just charlieroberts.com, sorry, gibberish, charlieroberts.com slash gibberish. And basically what gibberish does, um, so the Web Audio API provides a, a audio system for defining all of your audio digital signal processing using JavaScript. Um, and that's what this particular library, gibberish, actually does. Um, the problem with doing that is that every one of your audio nodes in, in the graph that you create is, you know, it's a function that's being called 44,100 times per second in a typical, typical digital audio setting. So you have to create very optimized audio functions in, able to, to be, in order to be able to do that consistently without causing lots of crackles and crashes in your audio engine. Uh, and that can be a tricky thing to do. So what Gibberish does is it provides an object-oriented notation for people to define these audio graphs, and then takes the, the graph that you define and flattens it into a series of function calls that, that get executed. And this can be executed much more efficiently than on every sample 44,100 times per second, trying to recursively, res recursively resolve all the dependencies of the various audio objects. So let's do a simple uh, example right here. Um, here's a vibrato that modulates over time. And the code on the left is the code that you would actually write as a developer using this library, where I'm basically making a couple of different sine waves. I'm, saying, I'm setting the amp of one sine wave to be whatever the output of another sine wave is. And then I'm creating a third sine wave that's basically taking mod one, adding whatever the value of that is on each sample to 440, um, and then connecting that to the master output bus. So you hear this vibrato that gradually gets wider and wider over time um, as these sine waves kind of fluctuate in and out in relationship to one another. Over here is the callback function that Gibberish actually creates. So it's basically just a function that accepts a bunch of other functions, and then those functions get called um, one after another, and the, most of the data that the function actually needs in order to uh, execute is, is inlined into the function argument. So in that way, we avoid, if there's object dependencies, we avoid having to kind of resolve those dependencies, because of course there's, a, there's overhead associated with that in dynamic runtime environments. Here we're putting those directly inside, inline it into the function calls. So here's the first sine wave that gets stored in this variable. That variable is then placed inline into the second sine wave, which gets passed in there, and then that gets inlined into the third sine wave that generate, is generated, which then gets fed into the master bus. So this enables um, some different types of signal processing than most JavaScript audio libraries are capable of doing, because you can process every single sample in here one at a time. Most audio processing libraries that use this JavaScript node uh, for generating audio process things in blocks of 64 samples at once. So you take each sine wave and you do 64 samples, and then you pass all 64 samples into the next sine wave, and then that goes into the next sine wave. And the problem with that is that you, it's very difficult to do sample accurate scheduling with timing. Um, you're basically limited to time. There's hacks you can kind of do to work around it, but you're, you're kind of limited to um, timing that's in blocks of 64 samples or more, so a little bit more um, than a millisecond. And the bigger problem is that you can't do feedback networks. So you can't take the output of one oscillator and have it feed back into itself to create different types of feedback, because there, there's no way to do that. You have to go through the entire 64 samples before you can get the output and feed it back into the input again. So here's just a quick example of a feedback loop um, inside of Jibber. So this is the kind of a map of, of the routing that we see up here where I've got this synth, it's feeding into a bus, it's feeding into a filter, it's feeding into a single sample delay unit. So there's a one sample delay and then the sample goes back into the, the bus and creates a loop. Um, and likewise down here, the master output is also feeding a single sample delay, which then goes back into this bus. And if you look inside the code, we see these calls to single sample delay, they, those return the last sample that's been stored. And these ones at the end here 
um, record the last generated sample for use in the next iteration. So there's a bunch of different sounds that come with gibberish. Um, here's like a, a, an emulation of a classic drum machine, a uh, classic analog drum machine from the, the 80s. Um, here's a, that synth, here's some string sounds, more synths. different types of effects. And so all of this stuff gets wrapped up um, and used inside of Jibber. But of course, you don't, you don't really have to deal with that low-level code. The other thing that Jibber Audio Lib and Jibber add to gibberish is uh, knowledge of music theory. So you can define scales. It knows what a quarter note is, all of those things. So you can immediately start making music with it instead of having to create those systems yourself. And this also runs inside of uh, Node, so uh, you can just npm install jibber.audiolib, and then this is the test. Maybe not your traditional Mocha or Jasmine test, but um, it, it, it works. Uh, and yeah, so you can use this code inside of any HTML page, you can use it inside of Node.js, and you can use it inside of the Jibber environment itself. The other thing that um, I've done is taken that, how many people have heard of p5.js? Anybody? One person. Okay, how many people have heard of processing.js? Okay, a little bit better. So processing is a creative coding environment for Java. Processing.js is a very clever hack that takes the Java code used in processing and compiles it into JavaScript. Uh, p5.js is a new version um, of the, the processing API that's written from the ground up in JavaScript. So it's not trying to do hacks to like compile JavaScript. It's really written um, from start to finish with the idea of, of using JavaScript in mind. So you can use um, Jibber with P5. There's a library called p5.jibber. Um, so there's a simpler game of life example. And this is basically the, the regular processing code that you see, where there's a setup method where you, you set up your canvas and do all those things, and then a draw method where you actually draw to the canvas. So there's also some interoperability with other environments built into to Jibber. OK. So um, in using Jibber, it's been used a lot in universities, um, both to teach entire classes. I have a colleague, Ryan McGee, who's teaching a class in the art department at UCSB, where he's teaching artists about sound, and then as they move through and learn more and more about sound, how to match sound up with visuals and, and create visual music systems. Um, it's also been used in a couple of different ways by Louisiana State University. So this is a, a performance um, where they're all running Jibber on their laptops, um, creating a, a networked music piece. And if you see here, over here on the right side, I mentioned earlier that there's a WebSocket-based chat system. They're using that chat system to communicate with one another um, during the actual performance. And they've also, at Louisiana State University, um, in the Electronic Music and Digital Media um, Research Group that's actually led by this guy right here, Jesse Allison, they've also led a series of summer camps for both middle school girls, which is the one we're looking at right here, and also for high school students, where the students start off learning a little bit of basic JavaScript in Jibber, and then slowly advance to building their own musical instruments that run inside of the browser. Um, and they also use a really interesting framework for designing GUIs for audiovisual performance called Nexus UI, if anybody's interested and wants to check that out. It's a really powerful system for designing interfaces for this type of performance practice. And in terms of education, um, the thing I, I'm interested in, going back to the Alice sphere that I discussed in the beginning, is what could happen if we bring kids into the Alice sphere, we surround them with this 3D content, they put on their glasses, stuff's flying past their faces, there's sounds moving around everywhere, and then we say, okay, now we're gonna let you guys go out and go back to your houses or go back to your schools and spend a few weeks or a couple of months um, programming things inside of Jibber. And when you created something that you like, upload that into Jibber's database. Then you can come back to the Alice sphere with your friends and your family and play it for them inside of this immersive environment. 
And so the challenge for me and my research going forward is going to be thinking about how to scale up from this single browser window to 26 warped and blended projectors and 56 channels of, of audio, um, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. It's gonna be, it's gonna be really interesting. Okay, so I've got 10 minutes left, but a little bit more than that, and I wanna leave time for at least a couple of questions. So I'm gonna maybe do like a seven minute performance, something like that. Um, uh, typically, when I perform, it's, it's longer, um, usually anywhere from maybe 15 minutes to I think the longest I've ever pulled off has been a full hour. Um, and what else did I wanna say about that? Oh, I also wanted to say, if you're interested, um, there are these events called algo raves that happens. And an algo rave is basically when a bunch of live coders get together and audience members at a club and live coders get up on stage and they do their performances and supposedly people dance to these, this type of, of music. It, it kind of winds up being a lot of head nodding and then every once in a while somebody will just go crazy for reasons that nobody actually knows. Um, but keep an eye out for Algo Raves coming to an area near you soon. Uh, it's just algorave.com if you want to learn more about that. So I'm just going to reload Jibber so I can kind of start with a blank slate.
Thanks. And there's still three and a half minutes for questions left. Yes, yes, but uh, oh, wow. I have, I have absolutely no words to describe this, but we should definitely have some questions. I'm sure there are burning questions in the minds of many musicians and uh, engineers and developers right here, designers. Like, seriously, you combined audio, visual, coding, everything together. Questions? Yeah. One, two. I think we are Better still one? breathing in and breathing out. Yes. <laughs> Trying to Hi, digest. Um, it was, that was like amazing. Like, like, Thanks, man. I don't know, it was trippy. Um, <laughs> but I, anyway, um, is there a way for Gibber to, you know, um, connect multiple computers and sync up the BPM? So, you know, like a couple of computers can work, you know, can collaborate on the same thing together at the same time? Yeah, I haven't implemented that as of yet, but I'm, I'm really interested in that. And there's been some, some cool work with that based on work that's been done in the video game you know, industry in terms of like syncing first person shooters and the events that have happened in there. Um, so uh, people have done that research, but I haven't, I haven't had the chance to kind of stick it into Jibber yet. So like um, right now, the only option for uh, multiple computers to work on Gibber together is mm -hmm. to actually sync up the BPM manually. Is that correct? Well, you don't have to do dance music. You could have it be ambient and textures, or um, you know, some person could program graphics while one person works on a beat, and another person could randomly play different talking samples. I guess they, the 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 cop out answer is you don't have to do things that are beat synchronized. Oh. Um, but but yeah, it would be it would be really nice if if I had that in there. And like I said, the, the research has been done. I just need to get around to to putting it in there. All right, thank you. Awesome stuff. Thanks. Gabe. So this reminded me of uh, you know, a lot of music that I've listened to over the years. Uh, I'm wondering, who are your musical influences? Oh. Uh, top few. Uh, I mean, like, ones that come off, off the top of my head, they don't have anything to do with this type of music, unfortunately. Like, uh, Stevie Wonder, um, <laughs> Keith Jarrett. Um, actually, there's an amazing live coding performance. If you have a chance, uh, look up live coding and Keith Jarrett, the, uh, a very talented live coder named Andrew Sorensen, does a just a beautiful performance where he recreates the piano style of Keith Jarrett, who was a famous jazz pianist who played with Miles Davis and led lots of famous trios over the years, and it's 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 really incredible. Um, yeah, sorry I don't have better answers that, that influence like this style of music. I mean, I like a lot of, of, of like dance music that also involves acoustic instruments. So one thing I'm interested in is trying to do more gigs uh, playing with live musicians. Um, that's something I hope I can do more of in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie Roberts, for that awesome performance and mind-blowing us. Thanks. Could we take a... Do we have time for one or... Okay, just one more question, maybe. All right. Yeah, wow, that was, that was impressive. I, I was wondering, uh, this currently sits inside a browser and, it, and in Node.js, does it currently uh, integrate with like hardware or any software um, that works with gibberish right now? It's yeah. Gibber, not gibberish. Uh, yeah, so you can read the mic input for, uh, into gibber and record that as a sample and then process it uh, however you want just like I was processing the, the samples from the Freesound database in, in the performance. They do actually have APIs for talking with uh, audio interfaces, like FireWire and USB audio interfaces. I haven't really explored too much of that um, yet, but it's out there. Cool, so it doesn't do any MIDI in, out? There is MIDI in and out. I actually have that as like a separate, you can download a module that does that from the, the oh, central cool. database. And yeah, I've got some demos of that. And if you write me an email, I can send you a link to those demos. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.